Hi, this is David Parrish, and this is the World Missions and Evangelism video blog. And I'm, I'm glad that you're watching this, and for the last several weeks on the blog, we've been talking about uh, how a church planning movement gets started. I call this Lessons from the Journey. And we've been given the history of world missions and evangelism and how I got involved in missions. And last week and this week on the blog, uh, we have some special guests here. We have Randy and Linda Travis, who are WME missionaries and are the strategy coordinators for the church planning movement uh, project, the Latin American Church Planning Movement Project, which is mostly in Honduras. And over here we have the, the co-strategy coordinators, uh, uh, Keith and Juanita Travis. And last week, we just spent a little time kind of getting to know this, this, these couples uh, for you that don't know them. And we wanted to, to talk about how they got involved in missions and, and different things. And it was just a great, a great story. If you didn't see that, then, then go on to our uh, YouTube page, the David Parrish YouTube page, and, and watch last week's blog. But today, what we're going to talk for just a few minutes is about the early days of how God directed these guys. I've kind of shared my story in the last few weeks of how God directed me to be a part of church planning movement strategy. Uh, but how did God direct uh, these? And so I want, and I think you're going to enjoy this story because there's two sides to this story. And so I'm going to start here with Randy and, and Linda. And Randy, uh, you remember it was in 2006 uh, that... Uh, you called one day, and I've already told on this blog a few weeks ago how we were planning on going to a training event, and it was going to be in Dallas, Texas with David Watson, and it was about the CPM strategy, and the other person, the other missionary that was supposed to go with me from India, uh, circumstances came and they couldn't come. And then out of the blue, uh, y'all called, and we were talking, and I shared it with you, and you said... Yeah, I want to be a part of that. And so it was a couple of weeks later, we found ourselves in Dallas, Texas. And tell the folks about the training and how at first it seemed strange to you, but, but, but how your, your thinking uh, process from the moment of first hearing about CPM, because you're a veteran church planner and missionary, but from that moment, you'd been a missionary for 25 years at that time. From that moment, this new vision gripped you. Tell a little bit about that. Uh, actually, David, not only not only did, have I been involved in church planning all my life, but I, I like to ride motorcycles. And my wife and myself were actually on a motorcycle trip when I called you, or you called me. I don't remember when it was, but th I believe that was in August mm -hmm. 2006, and that's when you told me about the, the David Watson Conference, uh, who was a missionary to India, and, mm -hmm. and had seen a lot of churches planted. And so you asked me if, if I wanted to go. Well, my wife had been feeling for some time that, uh, that some new things were going to happen well, in our ministry. Well, I believe ministry. the Lord spoke to me and told me that things were going to be different. And I kept wondering, well, what's going to be different? And I thought, well, it's not this mo not be it's not going to be travel around on motorcycles, is it, Lord? <laughs> <laughs> but on this trip, you got to talking with David, and he asked you to come to Dallas. And I said, Randy, I think that's a wonderful idea. You need to go and spend some time with David and have some fellowship. That's right. So so I told David, yes, I'll go. So <clears throat> I actually went to the conference on my motorcycle. Mm -hmm. I remember that. And, we uh, flew. Yeah, we think. flew from here and you rode your motorcycle. Mm -hmm. That's because I'm an adventurous missionary. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, we, we went. Uh, I went to the conference and uh, I think there might have been, what, 30 or 40 people at the conference. Mm -hmm. So it was a small conference, but it was very interactive and uh, a lot of things were said that were quite radical to me because I had worked all my life in, in a traditional way of planting churches and plant churches we did I mean even though we did it in a traditional way we saw several churches planted somewhere between 20 and 30 churches planted mm -hmm. and so but it was a slow go on average it would take a, a year to two years to to see a church plant from the time you first started going to a village until you actually saw church. It would take anywhere from a year to two and sometimes three years. But uh, we did uh, have a successful ministry uh, planting churches uh, in, a, in a more traditional way. But when we went to the, when I went to the um, David Watson conference, 
the ideas and concepts that were presented there were so radical to me that I just, well, first I didn't believe some of them, and then it, some of them just seemed so far out to me that I just didn't see in practical terms how they could work mm -hmm. on the mission field. But the one thing I never could get away from <laughs> was Brother Watson kept telling us about all these churches they had planted. At that time, it was like 40,000 churches. Mm -hmm. And over and that period, was at a period of 15 years. Uh, somewhere between 13 and 15 yep. years, yeah. Mm -hmm. And it was like 40,000 churches. So that kept popping up in my mind. And then what kept popping up in my mind also was the 20 to 30 churches that it took us a year to two years to plan each one. Mm -hmm. So um, we're talking about way over 15 years to see 30 churches planted mm -hmm. and they had 40,000 churches planted at that time with average membership of over 60 people in each church uh, if I recall correctly mm -hmm. That's right. and they had planted those churches over a period of 15 years Yeah. so as much as, as radical as the idea seemed to me and, and actually some of them actually made me kind of mad <laughs> but as radical as they seemed to me and so unorthodox I still could not argue with the fruit that mm -hmm. was being produced from it and so I had to sit up and listen mm -hmm. and I listened and of course you know how I debated back and forth with you because we were in the same hotel at night when we would get together I debated back and forth with you and, but anyway some of the ideas and principles began to sink in and so I decided by the end of the week that I wanted to try it. Mm -hmm. I didn't understand it all, and I still didn't agree with it all, yeah. but I was willing to give it a, a, a shot and try it. Mm -hmm. So that's how, how I made that paradigm shift from working traditionally to, to working in a CPM. And, and let me just follow up with this one thing, and then I want to talk to Keith uh, and Juanita here in just a minute. But, but, and immediately what you did was began a several month period of research and study. I remember that when we came home from that, you went back to Alabama where you all uh, live, and I came back here to Kentucky. And uh, I, I, immediate, I actually immediately left that conference excited about it, feeling that God was giving us a direction to go into Honduras as a pilot project. And I was excited about that. And Four days later, I got on an airplane and flew to Sierra Leone, West Africa, where a church planting movement was happening. And uh, it, was, it was an amazing thing, and Lord willing, I'll tell more about that in the next blog. But uh, I began to learn a little bit more about it, but you went on a period of time. You were emailing with people that you had met there. You were reading and studying and doing research online. When I, when I got back from Africa, you were telling me you'd even been emailing, I think, with some people in, in South America that had tried the strategy. Different, and, and, and you were, you were researching it. And mm -hmm. then uh, that was, that was, sept, that was uh, September. By, by late November or early December, you and Keith joined you in Mexico. He was in Mexico at the time. Mm -hmm. You and Keith and Richard Crowder went on a research trip over into Honduras mm -hmm. to to research the, the where would be a good area to get started at mm -hmm. and to identify the need. And I remember that trip and it was kind of a uh, that was kind of a harrowing trip but my, the point I'm making is you 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 got training, you opened your mind up to a new way of doing things. Mm -hmm. Even though a lot of it was going, a lot of the things you were learning in terms of church planning movement strategy was different from the way you had done evangelism in the past. Mm -hmm. But you were open to learning things, even if it, even if it was going the opposite way, uh, or you, it was stretching you a little bit. Mm -hmm. But a but lot, then, a, lot. a lot. But then mm -hmm. you you spent time in research, mm -hmm. that's right. and that's something that I'm you know we're, in this blog we're talking about principles, and I and this is what I'm saying. If you're interested in transforming a nation, if you're watching this or a region, and you want to say, well, would these principles? What is the, what are the principles that are 
that are causing this kind of multiplication worldwide. Well, I, I want to say to you, do some research, and I can give you some, some help on that. As a matter of fact, if, if you go to our website, worldmissionsevangelism.com, you can read lots of things about that. We can, if you send me an email, uh, contact us through the website, and I'll be glad to connect you with resources uh, where you can study and learn more about the strategy. But we did not just jump in and do this. Mm -hmm. We literally spent close to a year in researching the strategy before we even started. That's correct. And so, I, 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 look, I, I believe there's a place. Part of our one lesson for the journey is you never stop learning. No matter what you've done in the past, no matter what you know, uh, you never stop learning. So that's just a principle. Now, yeah, go ahead. And, and then after, after we did the research, I sat down and drew up this detailed plan. If yeah. you remember, then I presented that to you and to the board of WME, and David yeah. Watson looked it over, and he gave, gave me back his input on it. Yeah. And we came up with a plan. So not only do you need to research something, mm -hmm. then you have to plan how you're going to go about Trying right. to do it in the country or the culture or the area where you're you're attempting to to uh, to do intentional church planting. That's right. And so you got to have a plan. Mm -hmm. You got to have the knowledge. You got to have the paradigm shift. You got to have the knowledge. You got to keep your mind open. But then you got to make a plan, and then you got to work the plan. That's right. That's so, right. So so that's those are different steps that you have to take in this process because since it's so radical. It's hard just to leave one training and go start doing it. Mm -hmm. you gotta, That's right. You gotta, it's a process you got to go through, work yourself through, and, and, and to, to arrive uh, to, to some adaptation of it that will work for the area where you're, you're wanting to reach. That's right. And one of the things, you know, there's a management principle that uh, we talk about <laughs> in uh, a great management book that a lot of you may be familiar with. If not, I recommend it. It's called Good to Great. And one of the management principles of good to great is get the right people on the bus, get the right people off the bus. In other words, uh, you, it, it's about having the right team. And one thing about this, the vision was planted in our hearts in that, in that event in Dallas in September of 2006, but we had no team at all. And the first team member that was added was this couple right here. And uh, just just for the last few minutes of this blog, I want you to tell the story of what you were doing in Me you lived in Mexico at the time. You had no idea, mm -hmm. you had absolutely no idea what we were doing in Dallas in September of two thousand six. Tell us what was going on in your life and what happened that led you to be a part of this. In the year two thousand, uh, the Lord called me to when the Lord called me to ministry. He spoke to me, and he. He told me that I would go to Mexico and establish my ministry, and from there I would go to Honduras. But he didn't tell me what I was going to do in Honduras, and he didn't tell me when to go to Honduras. So I met my wife in 2005. We dated for a year. In 2000, June 2006, we got married. It was probably around April or May of 2006 that I, I, had, I began to feel that we were getting close to the time that we were going to go to Honduras. But I didn't know what we were going to do in Honduras. And so I called one of my friends up and I said, uh, Joel, would you go with me and let's spend a time of prayer? I, I said, I feel the Lord is doing something in our hearts and he wants us to take another step, but we don't know where to go. We don't know what to do. Well, all we knew was Honduras, but we didn't know where in Honduras. We didn't know what we were going to do in Honduras. We we just we just knew that we were gonna, gonna go to Honduras and we didn't know if it was really time to go now or should we wait later and so me and Joel we went out every day for two weeks we went out to this mountain to pray and uh, I would start off praying for his needs he would pray for mine just praying back and forth like that and on the last two days we just really began to call out. The Lord just began to meet us there. We were by this river, and the Lord began to meet us there early in the morning. And on the, on, the, on the last two days, the Lord spoke to my heart and said it was time to go to Honduras. And so I, I prayed to the Lord, and I said, Lord, I just need you to speak this to my wife. I need you to, to, to speak to her heart and let her know 
what your will is for us. And so I went home that afternoon, come in the house, and I noticed that Juanita was kind of thinking about stuff, and she wasn't very talkative and everything, but I, I, I didn't know what was going on, and I didn't mention to her what the Lord had spoke to me that day because I was waiting for the Lord to do the speaking to her heart. Well, the next morning we go back, me and Joel go back out there to pray, uh, and it was probably some, somewhere about 5.30 in the morning. We were just calling out to the Lord. And I, again, I asked the Lord, I said, Lord, speak this to my wife. Speak it to her heart and let her know so she can have peace. Because she was going to have to leave her family. She was gonna, For the first time, she's going to have to leave her, her country, leave her family, leave everything that she knew. So I wanted the Lord to speak to her about, about this. And he did, <laughs> because that, that afternoon when I came back, uh, I remember uh, I was I always knock on the door uh, to let her know I'm coming in. So I knocked on the door, and I was sticking the key in the, in the key slot there, and I, I began to hear someone weeping. And I thought, oh my goodness, what's wrong? So I opened up the door just as fast as I could, and she's in the hallway, and she's just bawling and squalling. I mean, just in tears. And I said, are you okay? She says, no. She says, the Lord told me it's time to go to Honduras, and I don't want to go. I felt this so hard, uh, so strong in my heart, and something saying, it's time to go to Honduras. And I just start crying and crying. And, <laughs> and so... We, we, sit on the, we went into our bedroom and we sit on the edge of the bed and we talked about it and we decided that we were going to go. And so uh, that Saturday, uh, we, we were going to go to Comitán where her family is from. We were living about two hours away from where her family lives and we were going to go and tell them our plans that we were going to be moving soon. Because I had promised my mother-in-law that, that if she would let Juanita marry me, that we would live close to them, you know, within a couple hours reach from them for at least a year so they could see how we how we lived and to give them some peace because I had already told them about my calling to Honduras. And uh, so they they were in agreement with all this and, and anyway we went to we went to their house to tell them that we were going to be moving. And while we were there, um, me and Juanita went to pick up her sister from school, and while we were, while I was waiting on them to come out, uh, I can't remember if I called Dad or he called me. I think I called him, and I was going to tell him that I was I was going to Honduras, and I was going to ask him if we could work with some of the churches that he had started back in the '80s. And I had no idea that they were planning on going. And so I tell Dad we're going to Honduras, and he says, "You are." <laughs> and I said, yeah. He said, well, that's funny because we're going too. I said, you are? I said, well, what are you going to do? And he says, well, we're going to go uh, do CPM and this and that and the other. And, and I'm thinking about it, listening to what he's saying. And I thought, well, you know. And he says, well, you, you want to come help us? And I said, sure. <laughs> I didn't know what, what I was going to do. And so to me, that was kind of like a confirmation, you know. Uh, maybe this is what the Lord wants us to get involved in. So... It, it all kind of happened right there, and we began to take steps of faith to to go to Honduras. I remember the initial going over there, uh, everybody was broke. We didn't really know how we were going to get there. Mm -hmm. We managed to get over there. We lived in our, in our, we found a house just a few days after being there. We found mine and Juanita's house, and we all lived in there, in our house for a few days, and we didn't have any furniture or anything, but then God began to supply he began to supply, and then my parents found their house and all that. But that's that's the way we ended up mm -hmm. in Honduras. Praise God. So I thought that you folks that watch this blog would uh, would enjoy to see how God put together an initial team. And you know, I was talking in one of the earlier weeks about it's God's work, and it is. And God not only gave the vision. And gave the uh, gave a strategy, but he gave an initial team, and uh, I, I I believe that that is a that's something that God often does, and uh, so 
it's just one of the lessons that you just have to get the right people on the team, but, you know, we, we don't even pick that. We don't prejudge people. We let God, and that's, it still works that way in Honduras and throughout Latin America to this day, that we see who God moves on, who God sends us. And because who God sends us, those are the people that are going to work in the project and going to be productive. So, Well, thank you guys for being here. I think this has been great. And uh, I'm glad we could get those testimonies on, on a video too. Because I don't think that, uh, I've heard that all these te testimonies, but I don't think we've ever shared them with other people like this. So. I'd like to say one thing. Sure. Uh, I remember when we decided to go that we, did, we were having trouble getting up the money for this project. But we decided at one point that we were just going to go ahead and go, and we were going to believe God to meet the need. But we wanted to go ahead and go where we could get there and get to know the part of the country yep. we were going to be in. And we began to meet together as a family quite often, mostly every day. And we began to make a list of everything we needed to get this off the ground. And the Lord, little by little, began to bring in all the finances and... And it's just been amazing what God has done. And, yes. You know, but we had to take a step of faith and believe God. And as we moved, God moved. And, Any undertaking yeah. you know, like this requires an enormous amount of faith. Mm -hmm. you, before you see the resources realized, you have to see them spiritually, so to speak. You right. can't always wait till you have everything you need, but you have to start moving out. And as you move, God moves with you. Well, I mean, that brings us to a part of the story that I'll, I'll, I'll throw in right here. Uh, and that is that that was in the fall of 2006, but in the spring of 2007, you know, we had put, you had put that plan down on paper. Right. And by this time, you all had done the research trip. Right. And we were saying, when are we going to launch? And we laid out a date that, we want, that you guys wanted to move to Honduras. And you wanted to be there by May or June. Because we had to get a team of Hondurans, you, and we had no, we had no Hondurans. We they had no, there was no, no development on the ground there at all. So the first step was for you guys to all move to Honduras, That's right. and we began to look at the finances and the budget and what it would take, and we we laid it out. We saw it's going to take X amount of dollars to do all this, and and we were expecting some financial things at WME to come through, and it seemed like the windows of all of a sudden. The finances they didn't just they didn't dry up exactly, but the the resources that we needed weren't here, mm -hmm. and so I kept thinking we can't send them yet. We can't say we're going to have to delay it. We're going to have to delay it. We're going to have to delay it. And I was actually on a mission trip in India, and uh, it was the last day before we was coming home from a mission trip in India, and I was in my room there in India, and I was praying, and the Holy Spirit spoke to me. Because I, I could look and we did not have the, the finances in the bank to say, okay, y'all move on mm -hmm. now. And I wasn't gonna I wasn't about to ask you to do that without being able to say, and we guarantee you this so much per month. And we couldn't do it yet. And the Holy Spirit spoke to me and said, When you get home, tell them to go on. Mm -hmm. Tell them to go on with no guarantee. <laughs> and I said to the Lord. Um, I, I, not in a rebellious way, but, and I don't know if I really said it, but this was kind of in my heart. No, I'm not going to ask them to uproot their family and move to another country with no guarantee of financial support. I'm not going to do it. It's what I thought, but that was the, the Lord didn't argue with me because why would the Lord argue with me? You know, I'm just a piece of dirt and he's God, you know. So uh, the conversation ended, you know. And I flew home from India. And the, I got home from India late in the afternoon, exhausted, went to sleep, woke up the next morning, and my phone rang, and it was you. Mm -hmm. And you said to me, David, we're going to move on with no guarantees. We're going to go ahead. Because you all had decided that. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and I, w I, w I didn't ask you to. Yeah. But you called me and said, we're going to do it. We're going on. And I said, all right then, because, yeah, that's just what God told me. And as it turned <laughs> out, little by little, God then did some, you stepped out in faith. And then God right. began to supply the need and, and so forth. So, well, praise God. I hope this has been a blessing to you, and I think it'll, it'll encourage your faith to watch. And we're talking about how it all got started in Honduras. I'll continue more on this next week. Thanks for watching the blog, and God bless you.